um, a friend. She is a colleague and somebody that I uh, admire and have learned from immensely. Um, and so I would like to um, give her the floor so she can talk to you about decolonizing our classrooms. Hannah? And you may be muted. Sorry, I had to get my really cool, uh, my really cool thingy going on. Um, <laughs> it, that, that would be a technical term. So anyhow, um, welcome everyone. My name is Shannon Brown and I am also a teacher at Robert E. Staff Middle School and I teach seventh grade uh, world history and, um, <clears throat> and Washington State History. And I'm also a curriculum specialist. And we are now charged with creating our scope and sequence for our year long Washington history and civics course that we'll have next year. And it will have an STI focus. So I'm just really, 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 really happy uh, about that and being a part of it. What being a part of that and being uh, allowed to be a curriculum specialist for like for real, and <laughs> not just not just in my in my spare time, is that I've been able to take a look at how we can decolonize our classrooms and decolonize our our content and and integrate STI in every grade level in every content area. And so that's kind of where my where my my passions have taken me this year. And so I have this presentation, yes, but I would. I would love to actually show you what I've been working on as well. Uh, I think it's going to be pretty good, and uh, and it it echoes what I've been talking, what I've been thinking about this year, and what I've been thinking about since the spring in terms of decolonizing our classrooms. And so I just wanted to share my stuff with you, and I just wanted to show you my really cool, you know, I I COVID has made me just a little more technologically literate, so. I'm talking about amplifying ancestors today, and that's not my term, but I'll talk about that in just a moment. What I want you to think about is, what do you think it means to amplify our ancestors? And we can certainly, you can unmute and we can talk, or you can uh, take a look at your chat and type in your chat what you think it means to amplify our ancestors. And I keep on thinking about like having the girl from Ipanema like playing in the background. Highlighting language, give them voice. How do we give the ancestors voice? Well, I suppose that's why we're here. And if I were in my classroom, I'd give more wait time and uh, that's just not gonna happen. We don't have time. I'd like for us to have more time to converse and ask questions of each other. <sighs> Since I've been doing this work, I've been doing this work a long time and I always come back to this quote by my friend, Shane Doyle. And when we started working together way back when in Once Upon a Time Time, excuse me, um, he said, something about history being dead. And I asked what he meant and he said, well, when we accept one perspective and we canonize it, we assume that we have everything that we need to know about history and everything that we need to know about the future and both of those things are impossible. And, um, sorry, I'm just gonna turn off my, my Apple Watch, I forgot about that. Uh, and that caught me and it has, it has been an echo in my head as I continue this work and as we talk about perspective and who gets to tell the history and now more and more who we include in the teaching of history, not just our students as, as the participants and the recipients of the knowledge. And so what, I, what I've been thinking about is I've been thinking about how the colonizer confiscates, eliminates, and then reassigns indigenous identities. And we do that in the classroom, but we do that in our culture as well. We do that in pop culture. We have the, the, the noble savage uh, or the bloodthirsty savage. We have, uh, oh, there's, there's my bloodthirsty savage right there. 
And then uh, when we get into Disney, we have the cackling old, you know, wise old sage or shaman. And, and then we have, uh, for those of you who are as old as I am, you have the, the, the um, relentless environmentalist and, and, um, and sad kind of keeper of knowledge. And then we can even have, even today, we have uh, the angry Indian. And so when you take a look at this, take a look at this guy here. Uh, this was at Standing Rock just a couple of years ago. And it, I found this image as I was preparing this presentation and I read the article that accompanied it. And they didn't name this young man. They didn't even name his tribal affiliation. And it occurred to me then that we are still assigning identities because this was a young Native American protester. They didn't even bother to find out what his tribe, what his tribe was, or even his name, because I'm thinking that the that the photographer would have been pretty close. And but they did mention names in the article. They mentioned all of the white politicians and actors who were coming to his rescue. And so when we eliminate and reassign identity of indigenous people, we we have we can we continue with with that, that singular identity and that anonymity and that taking away of identity and then reassigning that identity. It's just a different, it's just a different identity, but it, it, but it works along the same lines. And, and that is something that we have to stop doing. And that also means that we have to realize that we're doing it. When I, when I was when I first moved back to, to Washington State, it was in 1999, and it was in the midst of, of the Macaw exercising their, their tribal treaty right to harvest a whale. And if you were here during that time, you realize all of the um, horrible backlash and, and, uh, and vitriol that was spewed around the region. When, when the Macaw finally did take the whale, there's this, this prize-winning image and you have these, these three young men, these three fishers who are coming in triumphantly, and they're only identified as macaw fishermen. And it took me about two minutes to find out their names. And their names are Daryl Markishtam, Michael Steeds, Andy Knoll. And when we assign names, when we assign tribal affiliations, and when we stop saying, oh, that was a Native American protester, or that's a Native American tradition, then we, we refuse to have that colonial identity thrust upon not only the, the characters and the players and the stakeholders in the story of history, but also with our students. And the reason why I put this up is because I wanted to give you context into something else that I, that I discovered. And Maca the Macaw uh, whaling incident was so explosive, so incendiary that yeah, there were people who were who were basing their their doctoral theses on uh, and dissertations on this. And 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 so I ran upon this talking about this romantic notion of Indianness. And uh, it's you know who gets to assign the identity of the macaw, who gets to decide what is and isn't Indian because because at that particular time, there were so many people who were um, absolutely appalled and enraged that, that they were using modern technology and they weren't allowing the macaw to be able to evolve just like everybody else. And it's, I don't think that that's unique to, to native people. I think that that is unique to those indigenous pe people who have been colonized. And so what we, have to do as teachers is realize where that mindset comes from, where our, our, our structure of education comes from and what that does to silence the identities of our students and to, and to uh, silence their ancestors. And so I wanted to share just a little bit about what it means to, what it means to, what it means when we colonize education. You know, we've been doing a lot of reading at my school about, about how education came about 
and 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 taking a look at the multi uh, multicultural learning in the brain. If you guys have have uh, been reading that book, and and basically our our brains are wired to be in community. Our brains are wired to learn collaboratively, and when we colonize and when we colonize our education, not only does that confiscate uh, the culture and identity of the students, it also eliminates the, the role of, of, of family as first teachers. If you, uh, these are two photos here from the Tulalip uh, boarding school. And many of you already know that Richard Pratt, when he founded Carlisle, the first Indian boarding school, that his whole philosophy was to kill the Indian and save the man. But that also meant killing the family and killing the idea that it is the family and the community that educates the child, that cultivates and nurtures the gifts of that child. And so when we, when we, um, when those, when that relationship was, was split apart, was stripped, we ended up creating a type of educational system that, that we're in right now where we see that our students of color are disengaged. It's not just about seeing themselves in the curriculum. It's not that simple. And it can't be that simple because if it were that simple, we would be seeing all kinds of engagement now, right? Because we are including so much in terms of ethnic studies, uh, American Indian studies, black studies, and we're still not seeing that engagement, at least, at least I'm not. And you know, it just could be that a two-dimensional screen isn't the way to do it, but I don't think that's it. Uh, first of all, it's, it's what we value, we know that. What ended up happening in boarding schools is that um, children's identities were, were erased, but also they were told what good education is, their families were told what good education is, and then, uh, and then so that whole parental and communal task of educating children, that, that tie was just uh, eliminated. And so what that ends up happening, what ends up happening and what, has, what I think already happened in European education is that there was this abdication of, of familial expertise, of educational expertise of the family and of the community because they had to go away to school, right? Because that's what happened in Europe. You went away to have the experts educate you. And so that's the system, that's the colonial system that I'm talking about. That is what we have, that's what we're working with. And so I really, really, really want us to, to chew on that for a while. And I've been chewing on it a lot more lately because of COVID. We're seeing, we're seeing, uh, so many students disengage, but then also, uh, curiously, many students who weren't engaging in the live classroom are engaging with me now where they wouldn't otherwise. And so, and so there's just a whole lot of difference and a whole lot of change coming about. And if you're a teacher like me, you're looking around for how is it that we do engage our kids? How is it that we engage our families? And so I ran across <clears throat> this particular piece and it's all text and I hate doing that, but I think uh, it is worthy of screen time, the, the real estate that I have on the screen. And as I'm reading it, I want you to think about the message that this particular passage is sending to teachers and also what it might be sending to, uh, to families. So, it was called take, take Time to Educate Families on How They Can Support Learning When They're at Home with Their Students. And so this is actually specifically related to COVID and what we do when we have remote learning. And it starts with teachers have built their professional knowledge base over the years of training and classroom experiences. Most parents and caregivers do not have this background knowledge. Beyond communicating the logistics of virtual learning, it's important to invest time in educating parents and caregivers on developmentally appropriate strategies and expectations for learning. Guide parents on the importance of taking breaks from learning and communicate that it's both necessary and productive for children to take learning breaks throughout the day. 
He might share how to recognize some cues that a child needs a break and give strategies on how to structure a quick break. Throughout the year, as you introduce new content, parents and caregivers might require more detailed academic information given the structure of learning in order to support their children. And you might include how-to guides for math and reading work at home in your parent, um, in your parent outreach. So what do you all think about this? Turn off your, I mean, turn, unmute yourselves. Uh, write in chat, because my, my chat's over here on my other screen. But what message does this send? Or what's it really saying? The monolith myth. I'm really like asking, like seriously. <laughs> Parents don't know how to teach their own children like professional educators do. Yeah. Uh, a huge, I'm reading the chat, a huge assumption that parents don't know their own children. Yeah, I mean, WTF. And so, but we've taught that. This is the structure that we've set up. What this educator is saying, what this educator is saying is, is, is how we've structured our educational institutions in the first place. I mean, this, it was in August that this happened that this was posted and it was called personalized learning. And if this is what we're doing to personalize learning, we're continuing, we're continuing to confiscate culture and to eliminate it and to kill it. And so we perpetuate that image of, of being at the end of the trail. You know, we are at the end of the trail. We, we you know, our, t our students still, still think that Indians became extinct in 1830, okay, or maybe 1890. But, but that's because we do that. It's not our textbooks because they still think that even when we have, we're, when we're not using our textbooks. I mean, that's a badge of honor, isn't it? When we are as history teachers saying, you know, I'm, no, I'm not using the textbook. I'm gonna go and get what's real. But, but we, have, we have assigned identities for people of color, for, col um, for colonized indigenous people. And we started, you know, we start way back when it's like, you know, who ever shows Peter Pan anymore? But we still do. We still do this. We just repackage it. And so what we need to do then is eliminate those. And then we also need not only to allow our, 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 our native students and native identities to evolve, but we also need to realize that there is a wealth there. And the, and the trick is, is that, is that we already know that. Families of color already know that. And so when, when the education, when the, the, the colonial education um, machine organization comes on board and they're like, yeah, we need to engage families. You're like, um, yeah, maybe you think we've known that for a while. And, and so what we need to do as teachers is that we need to stop playing that same record, that same movie, that same DVD. And so here's where I want us to do some work. I want us to do some work today. And, um, and so I want us to take that particular piece, that August 26, 2020 piece that I just showed you, that we all agreed that really divorces uh, families from their children's education. And let's see if we can flip it. What happens when we flip it? How about we take time to educate teachers on how they can best support learning? How about we understand and recognize and accept that parents have built their professional knowledge base over the years of training and family experiences, that most teachers and IAs do not have this background knowledge because we don't, we can't. Beyond communicating the logistics of valuing learning, it's important to invest time in educating teachers and IAs on developmentally appropriate strategies and expectations for learning guide teachers on the importance of taking breaks 
and so on and so on and so on to support our children. What Superintendent Reichdahl was talking about just in terms of the, 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 the math that is included in, in, in planting, you know, planting crops or planting gardens and so forth, um, indigenous people already know that. It's indigenous ways of knowing. And, and we get closer to it when we have interdisciplinary uh, types of classrooms and learning experiences, to be sure we do, uh, because I would say I, I can only speak for what I've learned about Native education is that there, there was no such thing as science class. It was just teachings and, and everything about the world and how to protect the world and be in the world and interact in the world was all wrapped up in, in the communal learning, in learning how to be, how to be a person, how to cultivate your gifts. And, and so when I flip that and when we flip it as educators, we could really, really do some serious damage, don't you think? I mean, we could really engage our students. When we talk about, when we talk about, their, um, about their interests and so forth, we certainly see them come alive. And we've been trained, I think, to, to think it's because they're not doing social studies. It's like, oh, we get to relax a little bit. But, but it's, I think it's more along the lines of getting, it, it's, it's creating, that, creating that community, creating that, that learning environment um, and seeing our students as individuals and, and reconnecting in that way. And we strive to do that as teachers. I know we do. But that's only, that's only one piece. Remember earlier, I was talking about, about the, the, the family as the first teacher. And so, so I then did some more research and I ran across this young teacher who said, amplify the voices and stories of our students and their ancestors. And I love this because, you know, we're talking about our whole system being manifestations of power. And she says, it's imperative that we take a closer look at the text. Certainly we have, I, I, I believe that we're there. But when we ignore or diminish the importance of family and their ways of knowing, I think that we are also, um, we're also missing that opportunity to really, to really bring in um, the individual identities and the strength of, of families. Now, I am not Pollyanna and I'm not thinking that every family has it perfect because there are going to be some families who, who have divorced themselves so much and abdicated their responsibility so much that it's harmful. And, and, and when we do the investigation, then, then we know that. And, and, and certainly I'm talking, I'm talking generally but when we prioritize and humanize them beyond the month of a calendar, we can do that. And then this educator goes on to say, you yeah, know, but what if I'm white? And, I'm, and again, I'm not asking you to be an expert. She's talking about, you know, um, she's talking about bringing in more perspectives. I'm talking about bringing in the family. And, and when we flip it, and we ask the families for their expertise, I think that is really where we're going to have a lot more engagement and engagement in the social studies. And there are just a couple of things that we can do uh, in terms of our content. So let me just go over just a couple of things that I do in my, in my classroom with Washington State History. And you know, we teach our we teach our students in Washington State history that there are two regions, right? There's coastal and plateau when we're talking about native people. And never the twain shall meet. <clears throat> and, and I think that we do our students a disservice. I think we really do. We we oversimplify. And when we talk about the complexities of culture and the complexities of people's ways of being and knowing, then we can really get into, um, I think, students' own experiences. So if we take a look at this, these are cultural and geographic regions 
tribal regions in Washington state. And you take a look, they're really language based. And I'm not going to go into the importance of language and identity and culture and region and geography, but, but I mean, I certainly don't do all of these re all of these regions by any means. But when we show the complexity, when we flip it, we empower, I think, our students of color, and they start seeing themselves and seeing how. Um, the anglicized, colonized, educational uh, way of presenting information, even diverse, multicultural, multi-perspective information, um, that's not the only way and that we value them. Another thing that we do in Washington state history is that we flip it. And I think maybe this is where I got the idea is that we always see now, um, because, because native languages all over are coming back and, and, and as, as, as tribes are gathering their power, both, um, both their economical power and their political power, we're seeing changes happen. We're seeing, um, you know, you can see the, the, the native names of certain things. But what if we as teachers, when we're taking a look at, at um, the, the geography of whatever region we happen to be studying, is that we have the, the legitimate names, the indigenous names, and then in the parentheses in the smaller where we usually see the, the language, where we usually see the tribal name of something or, or, or whatever, that that's the colonized name, that we recognize that that's the colonized name and that, that these regions here, you know, they have, they have been renamed only recently. It's only been a blip in time that they've been called the Cascades or Baker or Rainier or Adams. And when we recognize that continuity of culture and language, um, I think that, that we invite our students in, certainly. And we allow them to, to, we allow them to bring in their identities. And I'm just gonna sh just share with you just a couple of things that, that, uh, that I've been using in my classrooms, but also in my writing, is that taking a look at Matika Wilbur's Project 562, where she juxtaposes that, that colonial identity of, of what it means to be Native to all of the vast, amazing, um, diverse identities that we have around our country when it comes to um, Native people. And, uh, and I Matika Wilbur is uh, also local. This is Project 562. 562 is the amount of federally recognized tribes at the, at the onset, at the beginning of her project. It's now 573. But, um, <clears throat> but if you are looking for then and now and then and now, especially you elementary teachers, when we're taking a look at bringing social studies in and, and you are talking about culture then, culture now, family then, family now, this is a beautiful resource for you. That when we go to the National Museum of the American Indian, we flip it and we, we challenge the identity of what it means to be native or, 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 or I'm sorry, what, what our colonized system has told us what, what Indians look like, what African-Americans look like and, and you know, whatever their separate causes are. And we and and we we flip that we challenge that, and so that when when our students see this, like wow, there's an African American boy there. How can he be native? Well, there's a story behind that. Jimi Hendrix, and then we take a look at um, we take a look at people from all backgrounds coming together. Um, this was commemorating the longest walk, and this is all from <coughs> excuse me the National Museum of the American Indian. Another thing that you can take a look at is illuminatives.org. And that site has toolkits. I mean, serious posters, images, everything, PowerPoints, where you can really take a look at, at, at challenging that stereotypical colonized um, narrative about, about what Indians are and, and who they've been and, and who they're allowed to be in this colonized system. And it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing there. And then we are just lucky to be in the Northwest where there is just all around us evidence of robust individual contributory political 
radical, amazing things happening with, uh, with our tribes. Yakima, uh, the Yakima Nation having its own internet network and power plant that we have Suquamish Foods that we have uh, in Puyallup, they have their cancer, cancer center that, that when we recognize those, we honor our heroes like Billy Frank Jr., like Ramona Bennett. And, uh, and we bring voice. And specifically, I've been thinking about, you know, bringing, you know, how does that deal with ancestors? How does that, how does that relate to bringing ancestors in? And it's something that I don't think that colonial education highlights or even really elevates to importance. And I found it here. This, these are some images from, uh, from Suquamish style or sovereign style. And it's a, it's a fashion show. It hasn't happened for a couple of years, but you have these, you have these contemporary fashion designers and they, they take their creations out on the runway. And, um, <clears throat> and this particular designer, she says that sovereign style to me is the contemporary expression of hundreds of years of tradition. And that to show her work it, it is that she sees how others are carrying on tradition. And that I think is uh, along with Shane Doyle's um, quotation that stays with me, I, this one stays with me, is that when we take a look at the contemporary, uh, when we take a look at cultural experience and cultural um, expression when we take a look at that as the contemporary expression of hundreds of years of, tra of tradition, then, then we are giving voice and we are amplifying those ancestors. And we do that through our students and we do that through including our families. And so, and so I think we as ed educators, as social studies educators, we need to make sure and and recognize that that when we take a look at when we take a look at all of the wealth of resources that we have to show that demonstrate that give witness to um, the contemporary expression of hundreds I would say thousands I would say millennia uh, years of tradition then that's where we are amplifying and elevating our ancestors. It's not just native people who, um, who always recognize their ancestors. I mean, it's indigenous culture. It's our way of being because that's how our brains are wired. And, and when we are able to bring forth these amazing people, then we are elevating those, am those ancestors. We are amplifying those ancestors. Oh, and my internet reports that something couldn't be found. I don't know. Oh. Well, maybe, maybe um, my, my, there we go. It just got tired for a little while. When we take a look at knowing our local heroes and identifying them, that we don't look at this as Native American activists and leaders that we recognize their tribal affiliations, that we recognize who they are, that we have their names, that we do this, then, um, then we are beginning that conversation of amplifying and elevating. So now I can have my students go back and it's like, who is Janet McLeod right here? Um, <clears throat> and how did she impact Rosalie Fish, who ran the, straight, uh, the state track tournament um, to raise awareness for uh, missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And, um, and then you start hearing the stories because she ran for my cousin, Stephanie Mendoza. She ran for, she, I mean, we, she ran for so many people and then we have these heroes and they will always talk about those who have come before them. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, when we do that, when we engage with that, then that's when we, we don't play that same record because it's our job not to just merely change the record, it's our job to transform it. And so when we, when we do that, then we invite and engage um, 
the identity of the student. But then there's still the question of, you know, how it is we, we, we can involve and recognize and elevate the expertise and the educational position of families with, with their children. And so, so I started writing. This should look familiar. This is um, uh, an IDM model that I'm working on right now, currently, as we speak. And so this is how I am starting that road because I'm at the beginning of the road as well. And, it's, and it's, so it's like taking a look at what we do and flipping it and bringing it home and not just having students interview their parents and then you know say, this is what they said, but actually integrating. So, so my, my staging, my compelling questions are great rulers, good people. Now that's not my, that's not my um, original compelling question. I found it on the, on the IDM website. Um, but one thing, the, the ribbon that is going to go throughout my supporting questions is going to be asking their families who are the powerful leaders and why are those powerful leaders in their minds, in their hearts, and, and you know, people that they physically or have in the past or would follow if they were still alive. And so then, so then that is the criteria by which we will judge historical leaders, Mansa Musa, Constantine, um, Empress Wu in, in this particular uh, IDM model, but then they're going to come back. Well, this is what Mansa Musa did. What you know, family? You said that you said that that our that our pastor has has the same quality. How do they compare? How do they compare? And and so the criteria, the expertise, the what they elevate, are is the criteria of of leadership that their family has developed for themselves. Now, I, I, of course, define family as extended family. You know, I, I would not ask my mom or my dad this question because they were too busy attending to their own trauma. But I tell you damn straight, I would have been, I would have been asking my best friend, Thea, I would have been asking her mom, Dolly. And she, and then, I'm elevating my family. I'm, I, I'm, and then this is my criteria for how I'm studying history. And isn't that the way it should be if we're going to contextualize? And so that's just, that's just one of the things that, that I've been thinking about and that I'm working on. And, and again, I'm still, um, I'm still in, in, this, uh, in, in the writing and planning purposes, uh, our, our um, progress of this particular unit. And so if you guys have any ideas and want to help me, Awesome. Um, one of the things is, uh, another thing is, remember at the beginning of the presentation I talked about, we always include indigenous or multicultural history, but it's the way we present it that still disengages our students of color. And so we need to then flip it. We need to present our indigenous history from positions of strength and resistance. And, and we've been hearing this for a couple of years. Certainly, as we take a look at the advent of American Indian studies in secondary education, ethnic studies in secondary education, at, um, um, black studies in, I'm just gonna say um, primary and secondary education. But here's some, here's some things that you can think about. Um, you know, what were the outcomes of the Indian wars? It seems just pretty darn, um, innocuous. But what if instead we flipped it and we said, how did the Yakima resist the in invasion of their homelands? So we have a position of strength, strength and resistance, rather than taking a look at what was done to the indigenous people. So instead of explain how Jackson used the Trail of Tears as a strategy for further Indian removal, we can instead talk about how John Ross used assimilation as a strategy to be able to stay on his homelands. And so you see how you can flip it. How did the Roman Empire expand? Well, how did Gaul resist their expansion, their expansion, their invasion? And so we can really flip it everywhere. 
we can. And so this is what I've been thinking about, and this is why I have my plan B. And so this is about STI because this is where I'm taking STI. This is what happens when you have the district that supports it and then they like, here you go, you got to run with it. And then this is this can be the result. And I just I'm real excited about about presenting these lessons now to my students because I want to see what happens on that two-dimensional screen. I want to see how many cameras turn on. I want to see how many more chats I get. I want to hear those voices because just like um, what Chris Rachel is saying, it's like I maybe have four or five students who turn on their cameras. But now I'm actually having them do backgrounds of their favorite animals. So now I have I have like the team's gallery with all of these animals, which it, we're getting there. We're getting there. So uh, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop sharing here. And thank you so much. Here's my contact information. If you are at all interested, take a look at our American Indian Studies page because uh, Seattle has taken STI and has run with it. There are a lot of things wrong with a lot of districts and Seattle has its, its fair share of warts, but they're stepping up. And so if you want to kind of take a look at, at what we've been able to do and what a native program manager Gail Morris has been able to do um, in terms of elevating and amplifying the voices of our ancestors, I want you to check that out. We even have our American Indian Resource Library, and that's where I want you guys to check out. If, you, um, if you're looking for those picture books, you're looking for picture books for, for indigenous studies or for ethnic studies or for taking a look at, um, at, our, um, at our region, that would be a really great place to go because, because our librarian is pretty fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And um, if we have questions or if we have time for questions, I talk a lot and I don't. And so we have we have some time, I think, for questions and discussion and help me make my unit better. <laughs> Um, yes, we absolutely do have time for questions. If you have a question for Shanna and you want to um, un unmute your mic, you can do that. Or if you want to put it in the chat, I can read it. But um, I just really appreciate you, Shanna, for coming and doing this today and sharing your thoughts on decolonizing our classrooms. So if anybody has any questions, you can raise your hand or you can write it in the chat. Just talk. I want to hear people talk. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Michelle Vinyl from Lummi Nation School. I had something come up uh, just recently during our distance learning. Um, in sixth grade, we teach ancient civilization and we all know that the victors wrote the history books. Um, I had never really thought much about the different theories of evolution because the Western world has pretty much accepted the idea that man, uh, mankind developed in Africa and spread out but I now have families in the background of my homes listening and they're challenging that theory because native uh, theory is quite different. Um, is there, are there lessons on STI? I've presented many of them, but I haven't been able to find very much on the various theories of the evolution of mankind and how would you walk that fine line I actually have, um, I've, I've actually taught, when I teach U.S. history, and, and Brooke, I don't know if you guys still do this because I, I haven't taught U.S. history for the past couple of years, but we do challenge that. We challenge Berengia, and um, because it's, it is a theory, and our textbooks we know um, always present it as fact, but also with how did, how did um, our question is, how did people get here? And so we present Berengia, we present and um, the Pacific Rim, the, the coastal theory. Um, also, I take a look at all of the all of the archipelagos that that go across the Pacific Ocean and that end up, you know, kind of around California. Like, you have boat people, man. You have you have you have millennia of canoe people who have ocean faring canoes that can go that. So we we talk about the possibilities, but then also, um, you know, another one is is that creation that creation theory as well. And I, I liken it to, well, how many of you believe the Judeo-Christian story of Adam and Eve? And that God created, God created humans, but did so in the Olduvai Gorge. Well, why couldn't it be over here? If we're taking a look, if we're taking a look at, at um, creation, that we have theories here and that they are valid. Um, let me tell you this, our, our 
Our challenge, however, is that when students see the things in the textbook, when they see the theories, they still buy the textbook. They still believe the textbook because the textbook looks so looks so authoritative. And so, and so, we did um, kind of just like a an inquiry on which which theories are are possible or which theories are are the alternative to Berengia. And so so there are ways. And so we we did um, we did write that and it was in the context of what does it mean to be a historian and that was one of that was one of the first bend in the lesson. So I'd be I'd be happy to share that with you. Thank you. All right, we have uh, a couple more minutes we want to wrap up by 1050 so everybody can take a break before their next session. Um, does anybody else have any questions or just want to jump on in? I'd like to ask a question if possible. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, Danny Freeze, Clover Park. Um, so we just uh, switched to year long Washington State history. Um, and it was before we were able to make a curriculum adoption with textbook. So we used the Gibbs Smith um, Washington Journey, which has no Native American stuff in it really. And um, I'm starting to make a look. I was just looking at the STI stuff for the Seattle schools and I've used Native 360 in my class, but I'm really just looking for advice on maybe some units or good resources that I can use in the classroom. Um, there, yeah, there, there are a ton. Um, I, would, I would go to People of Cascadia. I would go to, I would go to um, the League of Women Voters, the state we're in. That's actually in PDF form. And um, it talks about, it, it spirals it's um, tribal government as the first government and so forth. Um, and then also, um, just give me. The, uh, indigenous me. people's history. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about for Washington though. I was thinking about uh, indigenous people. Um, Native Seattle um, just came out um, that we have um, just a ton. So, so keep on going to the website and um, we and also Yelm did a, Yelm has a year long Washington State spoken treatment that we're taking a look as, we're, as we are creating ours too. Thank you and thank you all for putting in the comments. Thank you so much for um, uh, all the wonderful things uh, that you've done, Shanna. Um, you are a great speaker and I enjoyed every, all of that. And so um, I just wanna, wrap it up say thank you to everyone for being here today um and if you have any questions you can continue to put them in the chat and we'll we'll try to get them answered but um uh take a few minute break uh do a bio break stand up and stretch um and then the next session will start at uh, 11 o'clock hang out i'm gonna hang out here because there's so many things so stop using things like pre-colonial Colombian. You see how that's still so. Colombian. Um, okay. Shoot. Anything else? Any other questions? I'm just going to hang because, you know, I'm a teacher. I have a bladder of steel. <laughs> Rebecca Winecoop is up next. So, um, okay. All right. So I'll, I'll, I'll ski daddle then. You're more than welcome to stay if you'd like. She's going to be talking about blended learning. So, can I just very quickly ask Jana, do you uh, have a conference schedule where you would come up and speak to staff at Lummi Nation School? Um, you'll have to talk to my. You'll have to talk to Gail. You know Gail Morris. Yeah. All right. She's our. Yeah. Let's talk to Gail uh, about about how that can happen. Okay. Thank you. All right. Hi, Karen. It was so good to see your face. You're muted, though. You're still muted. Oh, she's not. She's talking to somebody else. She must be. Hi, Rebecca. Oh, I think you're still recording, um, Brooke. Yeah, let me stop this recording and then we'll.